Broadcasting live out of a basement in Appleton, Wisconsin. You're tuned in to Fox City's Core on WCZR Code Zero Radio. We're the show that gives you an opportunity to call in and be a part of the show. Our call in line is 920-358-0795. Core. Today's guest got involved with the Fox City's music scene in the late 90s with a publication called The Echo. He's a professional photographer and owns Jackson & Company right here in Appleton, Wisconsin. I'd like to welcome Dave Jackson to Fox City's Core. How are you doing, Dave? Great. Thanks for having me, Andy. <laughs> Thanks for doing this again. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Can you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, so I'm a photographer based here in Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, my specialty is at editorial advertising commercial work um, with a basis in the music industry over the past you know, several, several years. Um, yeah. So you, you got involved first in the music scene in the, the late nineties with the publication of that echo. Yes. The- yeah. Back, so back in the day, it was a, that was a, um, collaboration with my friend, um, Keith Bassett and I, and, um, I never expected that that would take me to photography because at the time we were covering local bands and that kind of brought us into a space where we got to know some 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 national bands do some interviews but you know mainly focused on the local music scene but that really kind of walked me into photography i think because you know i want to go and shoot bands for you know 25 bucks and a six pack of bud light or whatever you know so that that it got me got me there um but i have been in i had always been had this super passion for for music especially locally so say that if we can kind of go back even further you were involved in law enforcement for a while, but even before that, when you were growing up, like in, in high school, were you already heavy into music at that point? Uh, yeah. I mean, my first record that I ever got that my mom bought me, I was young, young, was Ozzy Osbourne's Diary of a Madman. Like, That's a good know, one. I was young. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I got into Van Halen and I was into heavy music and um, that always made a mark on me. You know, great guitar players, you know the dark imagery or you know of Ozzy always kind of intrigued me but that always that always stuck with me and I think for a while there through you know parts of you know college it, I wasn't as into the music scene because I was kind of focusing on my then career um but you know throughout that time I just I landed and in, back into the music scene and um you know that's always where my my heart had had have been has been so was it quite a jump to go from what you were doing professionally at the time law enforcement to going full on into photography yeah i mean i was doing photography on the side just as a hobby and then i realized oh crap i you know i can make i might be able to make some money doing this by you know expanding what i'm doing with photography and that could take me away from my career so that um kind of pulled me from doing you know weddings and senior portraits and stuff because i had been involved in the music scene for a while um photography was like it, it, it led me into doing cooler things, you know, with lighting or whatever. And um, it, it led me into some of the commercial advertising work. But that transition between, you know, law, law, my previous career in law enforcement into what I'm doing now, that was a, that was a weird time. It was a, it was a weird time because it's like, you know, I was burning all my vacation days to do this on the side, you know. And um, when you, especially when you like leave that profession, you know, I'm going to do this artistic thing and you're leaving like, well, I'm a cop. And, you know, most people view that as it's two, two totally different worlds. But yeah, the transition was, um, it was, it was a rough go, but it was, it was like amazing. Were people generally like supportive as far as like coworkers or did you have a lot of people like, oh, he's going to be back. He'll be back in a couple months. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was mixed, but that's interesting to say that. Cause I did have one person, you know, before I was leaving say to me like oh you're crazy you're crazy for you know for leaving this and then you know we built what we have now with jackson company with you know my awesome team and looking back you know I, yeah i miss the guys but yeah i got some of that i definitely got some of that you know so when what year did jackson and company officially start um oh boy 2000 2015 so not not too long ago really no, no, no. Let me backtrack. 2005. Okay, that's a lot longer. <laughs> Not <off coffee. laughs> like 2015, that was like uh, seven years ago. No, 2005 is when I think I took it more as a professional level. Um, but 
then like really truly became a full time thing for me um, in uh, late December of 2007. That's when I left my previous job. And Jackson and Company does so much more than just photography. You you do motion, video stuff. Uh, you do like a can't think of the compositing yep, just retouching of- retouching is like number one for us right now we do a ton of that so we get a lot of other clients like um i do a, we do a fair amount of work for hgtv a lot of their shows so we get a lot of those photography assets and we help put together those you know those ad comps or you know key art pieces is it for the shows kind of fun to get some of those packages of the the raw stuff sent to you to to work with to kind of look through it and oh, see it's what- inter- oh it's interesting <laughs> <laughs> yeah it we yeah, it's in, it's because I always come from a place of as a photographer and a retoucher that like know your craft really well inside and out and be really good at what you do, like by taking the picture and then be really good at what you're doing on the back end with post-production retouching. And sometimes they see some assets that I'm just like, wow, like <laughs> who shot this? So it's interesting to see. But, you know, um, that's what we do is we we make stuff happen. And even if it's not our own content, we that's half the fun of it is, you know, problem solving our way through whatever situation. I think that that applies to anywhere in life. It's like, if you can problem solve through whatever situation, you know? So when you were getting into photography for the first time, you just had a, a film, probably a point and shoot film camera, maybe like a 35 millimeter or. Oh yeah, it was bad. It was like the little disposables, <laughs> like, you know, those things. And I was just doing it because, Oh, I want to go get a picture of a show or, you know, take some photos at a show with blasting flash or whatever. Were you, yeah. were you like crouching in some cameras into some, some shows, like <laughs> stuffing them down the, the pan no, we, we, well, uh, there might've been a time or two. Yes. But we, uh, <laughs> like for the most part, you know, um, we try to get photo passes and, you know, to get photo passes back in the day was either really difficult or super easy to kind of BS your way in. And yeah, we got a ton of, that's why we met so many, so many like national bands is, you know, Oh, I have something that looks like a like a like a photo pass or a laminate pass. You flash at security, go meet the band or whatever. But you know that was back in the, the late nineties, early two thousands. Probably kind of a it doesn't work that way. Adrenaline anymore. rush too to, to <laughs> get in there. Yeah, <laughs> that's how I met the guys from the band Cold. Is we just kind of got in that way and were able to do some interviews, and they kind of helped you know Scooter help perpetuate my career there. So, but yeah, we you know and and locally, you know, you never really had to worry about that on a local level whatsoever. It probably didn't help doing the, you know, trying to get past security when you were, you were doing the echo because you at least could say, Oh, I work, you know, work for the echo, yeah, you know, or or whatever. But we actually did echo fast. Like (laughs) we had an echo fast. It's, um, I was just reminded of that recently. Was that like a bunch Um, of artists playing? Yeah. It it was like a bunch of like (laughs) local bands and it's pretty sweet. You know, do you remember any of the bands that played? Ah, no, (laughs) I mean, yeah, but like my, I just, yeah, yeah, it, it's early too. so long ago. Um, but it was, uh, just a lot of more, you know, local metal bands and, you know, I wonder if there's, I think there's a handful of metal bands from the, the area that are still around today. At, oh yeah. There's like head headstone. I don't know when they started. Yeah. But. I'm not familiar with them. Um, I don't know if profane still doing anything. Oh yeah. Profane. Yeah. Mortis I, gold. Uh, Mortis Gold, they were, um, they're still around doing great. Death Metal Band, I, I believe they're technically Milwaukee-based. Um, I think John John Hill is up, up this way. Um, but yeah, there's there's a handful around, and some of the new bands that are coming out, they're killer. Choke. Choke's awesome. What what caused the demise of the Echo? You guys um, just decided to stop? I think life in general. <laughs> <laughs> and like career, right? Um, and then it was just too much work. We, we, we did it all for free. Like that was all for free just did it on our own time it was more of a passion thing and um is it archived anywhere i think you can find it someplace i should maybe, maybe i need to like put it up on my because i think <laughs> i still have all those files like i could like bring that up that'd be interesting on my my website someplace but um way back machine maybe way back machine.com whatever it is it's a great you can still great i think website. you can still find some of that stuff and i think i think that the echo led me into like creating my own website my own series of websites until, you know, through my photography or showing, you know, what I was passionate about, you know. So what was the hardest part about starting Jackson and company? Um, well, paying a mortgage. (laughs) (laughs) 
um, balancing life and, you know, I, I mean, to, to become self-employed is, you know, crazy. And, and I left, I left my previous career in 2007, 2008. So that was a terrible time for the economy. And, um, yeah, not, not easy. Um, but it was worth it though, because I stuck with it. I stuck, I stuck with something and I stuck with it even in the terrible times when it's like, you know, cause I left the one job to do, to become self-employed and I'm, you made no money. You know, I took a huge pay cut and it took me years to where now, you know, I have, um, two full-time employees and a part-time employee, two part-time employees. Got to throw my wife in there too. <laughs> She's the brains of the operation, man. And it, so, she must have been just really supportive to to make that move. Without her, without Melanie, oh my gosh! Like you can't, you got to to be able to make a transition like that in your life. You have to have a hundred percent support from the people that love you, mainly your spouse. And um, without having that, I, you know, I don't know what would happen because even in the times I was like. Dude, I gotta like, I'm gonna I'm gonna walk away from this because it that might be the easy option. And I've known friends that have become self-employed because and 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 walked away from something after six months because that's the easy option. She was the one that was like, "No, you can do this. We can do this. We can make this work." And to this day, you know, every time I find myself in a rut, she's the one that's like, "Dude, you can do this. We can do this. We're gonna we're gonna find a way through whatever issue, you know." That's so great. yeah, that's so that's that was really important. Instrument instrumental in creating that and and taking this to the you know taking this to the the next level and which we have. And I don't need to do all the coolest crap with Jackson Company. I don't need to shoot the biggest rock stars or I just I I need to be happy and take care of my own you know my own my you know my family my employees are there at the forefront. So well, you've you've shot a lot of famous rock stars, and I think yeah. that. The perception might be, well, that's awesome, but is there any downside to, to filming or, you know, photography, taking photography of big rock stars? Um, sometimes <laughs> I think, I think I say, don't meet your heroes ever. <laughs> Cause you'd be like, Oh, that's what they're really <laughs> like. I've been fortunate with a lot of my experiences, um, doing that really, really fortunate. And then, you know, I've had some some rough experiences with it too, especially you know I've, I've photographed a fair amount of people that I know have, have passed on, and um, yeah, it's really it's crazy to see that you know. But in general, it's like you know these people made all this amazing music and done all these cool things, and I just you know I want to be on the human side of that, you know, because these people are they're human like you and I, and I think that's part of the whole experience more so than the camera or the all the gear and. You know, even music to some degree is like these people are they're humans and they have emotions and to see that to to see that and be able to access that and build trust is huge. The first time I recall seeing one of your photos, I believe, was uh, some Sunday flood pictures that all of a sudden appeared online, and they were just mind blowing. Like the the color, the texture, everything, and. and if I if memory serves me right, they were doing like a detective type thing, so they're all dressed up. It was just really weird to see it. Like yeah. this is cool, like because yeah. there wasn't a whole lot of that in this area, especially with, on the local scene. But I mean, was that something like it? Obviously, you've known the the flood guys, yeah, that, long time. How did how did you approach them to to do this? Um, I can't quite remember. I mean, I've known Eric for a long time. I love him. Um, I just I, I just knew that I could work with them and work with them easily because I had that relationship there and I think everything's relational. Um, but I think that they there was an inherent amount of trust so I could come with these crazy ideas. And by that time I was exploring lighting and doing some because the first series of Sunday Flood pictures we took on railroad tracks back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago, like I'm talking like early 2000s were terrible. And then I like as soon as I got better at things, I reapproached. You know, I re reapproach them and go, let's let's shoot this, let's let's do this crazy idea, and that's what it was. We had a ton of fun, you know. But I think it's I think it's more so than anything. It's about the those stories and those experiences, you know, that you have with somebody or 
being an um, experienced photographer, what are your opinions now on like railroad tracks and don't brick walls? <laughs> <laughs> Was a rock and roll confidential? <laughs> like this terrible band photography? Don't do it. Go get away from. Yeah, don't expend railroad tracks, or you'll get ticketed. I know. I know. I I know the Canadian National Officer that's up in this area, Gene Meyer, and he, you'll get you'll get ticketed. So don't. And it's dangerous railroad tracks. So if there's photographers listening, don't don't do it, don't do it. Don't just <laughs> just go look at other cool pictures online and replicate those. No brick walls, no train tracks. Avoid the crossed arms. <laughs> so you, you got involved in portraits. You, you know, a mile of music. How did how far into was that 20, 2015? Was that the first time you you did that? Um, yeah. Well, it was mile two because the first mile of music. I'm like. Pfft. This is stupid. Because I never went to it. I just had like an opinion. And I was all grumpy. We're and, all the metal bands. Yeah, we're all the metal bands, <laughs> which is an interesting story too. I'll get to in a second. But yeah, we, um, so I, I was just, I, it was the second mile and we partnered with John Adams um, from Feather and Bone. And we went into the space and got this awesome warehouse space. And, you know, uh, just, I, I wanted to shoot artist portraits because I knew there are cool people coming through and I just happened to get Langhorn Slim and Richie Ramone partied with Richie Ramone. That's pretty cool. Um, and it was a crazy experience. And after that, we're like, we saw at the end how much those pictures meant to other bands and musicians to be able to do those portraits for free. And, um, it made a huge impact and it just took off from there. And to where we are now, which this last year, we, you know, we just did it in our studio because we couldn't find a space. And normally we always like to have our own unique space for that because it's experiential, like at anything we do. Um, but we couldn't find a space because there just wasn't, there wasn't that, it wasn't available because normally we get a space donated to us. And for several years, we had so many great people that come. And it usually has to be on the Ave, can't be something crazy. But we set up in our studio last year. But um, metal bands on Mile. Mile of Metal. <laughs> so Chris Gold says all the time, Mile of Metal. Mile of metal. Um, I, actually, I actually, one year, reached out to Norma Jean to see, see what would it take for you to come here? I talked to Corey, the singer. Like, what would it take for you guys to come to Mile of Music and play a show and just disrupt the whole thing? <laughs> throw a wrench and you know wrenching the whole thing but um it's too expensive oh that's too bad he's a great guy great friend but um but then you know i think this coming year if we get a space we have uh it's gonna be a it's gonna be a good one hopefully we'll have bring in our own you've had bring some in choke play that'd be cool you, you've had some really cool spaces yeah like the old crematorium yeah uh, just wow. like and yeah. just the the displays you set up typically like some of the portraits he took from the past and sometimes I, th I think he had oddities at one when you were at the old um harmony yeah bar there's oddities Scott Watswick, 43 just, skulls had all the oddities but awesome the you know we uh we just want to make an experience it's not just one thing like last year or the year before last we had you know every year we have marty sosnowski with his storytelling um, he does a storytelling event with us he partners with us um scott from 43 skulls partners with us he's been great um, last year we had Matt Lombard and I think, uh, you know, if we get a space this coming year, which I'm sure we will, or wherever it is, I think, um, you know, Marty and I were, were discussing the possibility of, you know, you know, doing, doing some sort of event or celebration of Shane Krieger's life. And Shane, for the, the listeners was a, a staple of the Appleton scene for quite some time. He, he owned and ran Appleton Imports on College Avenue, which if you're into music in the nineties, two thousands, you know, you knew who Shane was. Um, but yeah, he recently passed away and you had some portraits that I think will serve his memory very well for, you know, coming up for yeah. generations. Yeah. Um, yeah. Shane, what, what a legend, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you wanted to know anything about music, he was your guy um and we lost him and that's very very difficult um you know i think more so than you know him you know as you know his legacy is with appleton imports there but you know him being a um a son a brother a father a grandfather and 
meaning so much to so many people is at the forefront of that. But yeah, um, that was a tough one, you know, because I, uh, you know, I, I've known, I had known Shane for 26, you know, 26, 27 years. I mean, I walked in there in into Appleton Imports in 1996 looking for any tool thing I could get, right? <laughs> and there's this guy in there. I'm like, oh man, this place is awesome. It smells great, <laughs> you know, it's incense, you know. Um, but, and then I was like, he's like, I, I don't have anything, you know, like I just see, you just see music everywhere. And he, like up on the wall was this great tool undertow vinyl promo. And I like, I want that. He's like, it's not for sale. <laughs> don't, don't even look at it. It's like Spinal Tap. Don't even look at it. You know, it's like, you know, and, and I'd gone in there for years and I, you know, had become, you know, acquainted with Shane really well. And he still, to, you know, nope. Can't have it because he he knew, but I had it was like I reconnected with him I think in 2015 or 16 when I shot that portrait of him, this infamous I wish I could hold it up right now but this infamous infamous portrait of him like behind the behind his his counter, I mean that's that's Shane Krieger, and I had shot that that portrait and then I reconnected with him, and we got really close the last like five six years, and he calls me up one day he goes come down to the shop I want you to have something. And here's that, here's that tool undertow gray promo on vinyl, because he knew how much it meant to me, and that was, you know, that that was my favorite band, and I think that he valued, you know, what I was doing, and and that, and you know, giving him that portrait, you know, I think that's how it works, relationships work, and um, he just became really special to me, and Marty, and um, I was able, you know, Marty and and Shane didn't see each other for. They were the bestest friends. All oh, the stories are incredible. Um, they didn't see each other for a number of years, and um, at the last mile of music, the twenty what was it twenty twenty one mile of music, I was able to get those two reunited, and that meant the world to me to do that. And um, yeah, so he has a legacy there. Special guy, loved him so much, and so many people loved him. You only get a certain amount of friends like that where you can you know, have the history and then pick up right where you left off. Yeah. So it's quite a, quite a huge loss. Yeah, for sure. Um, but just having that, you know, it, it's interesting you say that as, you know, friends that you can not see for a long time and then just re-pick up right where you left off is like, that. that's friendship. That shows someone's character, for sure. We are joined by photographer Dave Jackson today. You are... You're very familiar with Choke, aren't you, Dave? Yeah, love those guys. <laughs> um, you know, I had I had known Caleb, their guitar player, for quite some time through Chris Gold's band. Um, but then I I reached out to, and I have a history of reaching out to bands, but I reached out to uh, Dusty and just started a relationship with him on line, just talking to him, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, and um, I like, like, wow, these guys, these guys got something going on. And when I see that, I'm, I get pretty excited. I'm like, let's go start off. Like, let's do, let's go shoot some pictures. Let's go shoot some promos. Cause you know. Oh, you did a, a music video for them we too. We did a music video for Lust for Death. Yeah. And, and if you thought that song was chaotic, the video matches the yeah. the chaotic, chaotic uh, yeah, we, music. We, we shot, so they got, um, so they got signed to Translation Lost Records and um, more of distribution and you know, they're, they're taking good, they took, take really good care of the artists, but um we um, went out to uh, um, Nate Lenz's place in Hortonville in his warehouse and shot that in a warehouse and like he owns a clear clear view no mm. he um, Kinsman and Co so um, so we shot it in his warehouse and it was like hot there's like no light it's so hot you know we had just enough equipment to get it done but you know we spent a couple hours out there and uh put together this video and I think I think Adam when a Adam Kepke he cut it together he you know works with me so he like I think it's the most cuts he's ever put in a in like a one minute 12 seconds you know video for a song because there's they're you know powerhouse you know death metal grindcore it's definitely fast fast death pace. grind yeah um like just like the most cuts he ever put together just to like get all those pieces together was like this like daunting process because it it that song you know Lust for Death just hits so hard, so fast. I mean, and just the the level of musicianship in that band's un, 
unbelievable. All of them. They just they all came together to create this brutal, in your face metal, you know, death grind EP. It's awesome. So, anyways, yeah, good friends. Love it. Love love doing that stuff. So. Not only did you do a music video for Choke, I believe you did a video for Queens, Rick. I don't know if that ever <laughs> did that ever get released. Uh, sure did. <laughs> um, we did a Queens video in Appleton. In that's that's in the Lacoon. Nineties me would be excited building. about that. <laughs> yeah, right. So they have. So they're. It's like there's always like, well, which Queens is it? Is it the Jeff Tate Queens or is it the Todd Latour? Um, Todd's their singer now. Um, but you know, they still have Scott Rockenfeld in the band and the whip and, um, but we did a, we did this music video in there and, um, our intentions were, were to be, um, one way. And I think the, the label and the band came back and we're like, well, <laughs> we're going to give it to Scott Rockenfeld, the drummer, his wife to edit. And then they put a bunch of special effects on it. No disrespect to that, but you know, two visions, you know, coming together. Um, but yeah, it was pretty crazy. I like shot a Queens right music video and I'm not, and I put this out there. I'm not a fan of shooting music videos. Oh, like, why not? Be, well, I, I am. If I really like your band, <laughs> 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 I don't mean to, I don't mean to be mean by that, but like I am, or, you know, the, the painting spirit, right? Because there's so many moving pieces to it and you have to like, it's not like a, a, you know, it's not like a two hour photo shoot. It's like there's the back end of that and like crew and lighting and, you know, getting everything right. There's so many moving pieces to it that it's like, um, it's not my thing. And there's people out there that really excel at that thing. For us, it's like any sort of personal work that I do. My, my heart's got to be in it. My passion needs to be in it. You know, well, you really have to make sure you get what you need during that shoot too. Cause if you miss it, you're, oh, yeah. it's not easy to just go yeah. reset up. Like you yeah. said. But or or if you don't know what you're doing, you know, <laughs> there's awesome, um, uh, native American black metal band. It's one guy, uh, black braid and it, <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I just love it. So, uh, great, great EP that they have out, but like in like three of the shots, there's like a dust particle <laughs> like on the, on the, on the video from the sensor, you know? So it's like, um, there's a lot of moving pieces to it to make sure everything's, everything's buttoned up. It looks great. You know? With, it's with doing music videos do you find yourself constantly like evolving as far as expanding what you do and how do you prepare do you just dive in start researching and then take on a project and just kind of figure it out along the way um I, well i think with music specifically first of all first thing is the music what what you know what's the what's the band what do they sound like what's you know what you have to do your homework when you walk into something you know you know what what's their message what's the vibe you know, you need to have that, have a relationship first, the human relationship, and then you can think about some of the art stuff. You know, what's the, what's the narrative here? What does it need to look like? You know, how do you light it? So there's all those. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> kind of. I mean, as far as like getting into something you haven't done before and, and doing it. Yeah. I mean, it's plus there's equipment to buy. And yeah. I mean, I, when I started photography alone, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I was, you know, fake it until you make it. And I started, but I put in the time to learn. If you really want to do something awesome, then you got to put in the time. You, you got to put in the time, right? Before you can get good, you know. Do you, do you get people that, when you're getting quoted to do photography, they're like, you just have to show up and click a few times. You oh, know, yeah. Can- <laughs> oh, yeah. They are, that's people who don't know any, don't know the process. But, you know, I think that, to, you know, talent, you know, talent is 10,000 hours plus luck. You know, you got to put in all your time and then you happen to get a little lucky around along the way. And then you kind of figure out the formula. And I, I look at myself and I don't even have it figured out. We've, uh, we've got a question here. Awesome. Uh, which is good. So it's on my list. <laughs> it's from a uh, Tony. He, okay. he asks, Worked a lot with Vinnie Paul. How does Dave feel about the Pantera tour? Does he have any interest in going? Yes. Um, they are playing Rockfest in Kadat. Um, you know, you hear so many naysayers of like, oh, it can't be Pantera. And it's not Pantera. But 
again, if you're celebrating the life of the Abbott brothers, you know, Daryl and Vince, I mean, why not? Well, and you've got kind of a personal connection because you you shot Vinnie Paul. Yeah. You've been at his house. Yeah. Yeah, uh, at his house in Las Vegas, which is surreal, right? You know, when I was a, when I was a kid, eighteen years old, I'm cowboys from hell. You know, driving in my mom's Ford Taurus in my Boy Scout uniform, coming home, got pulled over by the cops. Same cop twice the same week, lost my driver's <laughs> license. But you know, those experiences like that, like cassette tape. I'm like, this is an awesome band. And then fast forward to 2013, when you're in you know Vince's living room and you're looking at all dimes guitars hanging on the wall. You're like, where, what, where, how did, how, how did this happen? You know? And he has a teddy bear on the back of his toilet in his bathroom, you know? <laughs> and on that teddy bear is that razor blade dime bag Daryl's razor blade necklace. And you're just like, what? When you were at his house, were you trying to play cool or were you kind of trying to sneak a couple pictures here and there? No, I was just cool. Because I think that, I think in any situation, if you walk in as a friend, as opposed to a fan, you start fanning over something in those situations, it, you you could lose control. Very, you, you lose control of the ship. You know, I think that you have to approach them as real people, and that's what it was. It's like I want to know more about, you know, this experience. I went, I was in uh, Vegas and went to his house in 2013 when I was out shooting uh, the band Hell Yeah, Chad Gray from Mudvayne and Tom Maxwell from Nothing Face, and um, so that was crazy crazy experience but I, then i got to know to know vince and he when it came to doing promo photos i was the only guy he would trust you know he built other relationships after that but th- i mean that's really humbling you know and then we find out that he passed away you know i've worked with you know a couple musicians now that are gone ollie herbert from all that remains vince obviously trevor sternad from the black dahlia murder you know, we lost him a year ago, and I had kept in contact with him. And because those relation, the thing is, those relationships that you make, they extend beyond the camera or the LP. You know, and that's the importance of it. Is you know, you you carry on those relationships with the right people, and that's just really cool. You know, to to make new friends and constantly making new friends and having those experiences. You know. Well, some, someone like me might look at some of the portraits and be like, oh, that's a really cool portrait. But when you're looking at them, you're thinking, well, they were, they're looking at me, you know, in that, that moment in time yeah. and during that portrait and going back like to Shane sitting in the, the store. Yeah. I mean, you were, that was kind of also not only a, a clip of Shane's life, but a clip of yours, Yeah, which is pretty deep when you think about yeah. it. Yeah. And it's, it's a moment in time, right? And, you know, some of these people that have passed in our lives. You can, you know, you have those photos, you know, we, you have those photos of, of them and that means the world. You know, my, my nephew Ben passed away in 2018 and I have those photos and those are, I mean, unbelievable what those mean to, to me and, you know, to Ben's family, my brother. And, you know, I, I think that we have to do due diligence, you know, as creatives to memorialize things or people the best that we can because there there there's a history there and and just continue loving people man <laughs> you know like you must have a lot of hard drives <laughs> a lot <laughs> <laughs> i was just joking with adam kepke works i adam works with me like i have so many pictures of him standing like light testing like <laughs> like you know on white seamless like i need to tap, test this light setup adam stand in there so someday down the road when he's memorialized, it's just gonna be like <laughs> thousands of pictures of him, like standing in front of this like sweep with me light testing. But yeah, um, having pictures, man, take pictures, even if it's just this phone, you know. Do you feel kind of resistance to the deleting pictures that you've taken, even if it is, you know, you take a couple test shots at them or whatever? Yeah. I, I I archive everything. Everything, so it's because you just never know. Yeah. <laughs> Have you run in any situations with that? Uh, Hard drive failure. Knock on wood. <laughs> um, well, yeah, a few, but like I have so much redundancy okay. in what I do. My my workflow, a ton of redundancy. So, you know, stuff in the cloud too. Have you had any 
you were, were talking about bad gigs for musicians. Have you had any bad gigs go bad as far as equipment malfunctioning or not having what you needed? Well, yeah, you know, no. I, I mean, I, ha I have. Like I was on a, I think I was on a photo shoot for Comcast Xfinity one time and I couldn't get a program to work. So you have to like figure out on the fly. But I think, you know, your, your background and training, if you can figure that stuff out on the fly and look super cool while you're doing it, <laughs> like that's a win, right? You know, <laughs> so um, no, no major incidents because I think if you walk into something with preparation, yeah, well, yeah, I have had one. Um, so I was, so I, back in the day I went to the, uh, per, uh Appleton performed the PAC performing arts center to shoot. I had an opportunity opportunity to shoot. Got like two minutes to shoot promos for the plain white tees. And I'm shooting on this little Canon, this Canon 10 D and I'm shooting these pictures. And I, I had everything set up. I had everything figured out shooting all these pictures. And at the time those, you know, those LCD screens were like, you know, size of a, you know, a quarter. And I'm like showing the manager and the band these these pictures because it was like, it was just after they came out with their like number one song, Hello, Hello Delilah. Delilah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're like, oh my god, these are the coolest pictures ever. This is great. We're gonna let our manager know the whole thing. Manager comes back, you know, get manager's info. Go back home. Realize my autofocus was turned <laughs> off the whole time, and because the LCD was so small and I couldn't zoom, like everything was completely blurry, and I was just so defeated. You know, I couldn't put 15 layers of sharpening on top of it to save anything because it was just gone. So you learn, right? And good thing that wasn't a paid gig because a lot of my experiences have been, especially with bands, is like I'll reach out to a band and I'll do something if I really like them, do something for free, and down the road that leads into, you know, a paid gig. Let's talk about the stuff you've done for free at the portraits again. Let's let's go back to yeah. my music. Um, do you normally like it get a chance to talk to any of these artists did a lot of the artists hang out you know at the venue that you've got yeah normally i reach out to the like last so in years past like their welcome packet through mile it'd they would be put something, something in there, in there. Yep. i stopped doing that um maybe next year especially if we get a space I'll, I'll, I'll do that or see if i can do that um just the quantity like the in the i know at one point you said we're taking portraits of people we haven't taken portraits of because I th you must be taking thousands of pictures. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> because sometimes it can, in some of those years it got really overwhelming and then some years you get, you know, cause generally I like to either, you know, look at, you know, new faces or people I haven't worked with in maybe a few years. And then if it's the same thing over and over again, it just gets, you know, I want to, I want to put that, I want to see those new faces, meet those new artists and give new opportunities to people. And sometimes it, it would get overwhelming. But last year, because we were based in my studio down the flats, I just would reach out. I'd like go through the mild music playlist like, oh, this person has great sound. And, you know, I would reach out to them specifically. And so we had those opportunities and got a few cool folks in. Um, but I mean, putting yourself out there, ask me that, you know, 20 years ago never would have done it but now it's just part of that experience when the portraits go out of course everybody loves them and yeah. wants to use them on everything do you have any feelings either way towards all these pictures all of a sudden being used on flyers and promotions i think that's what it's for though okay I'm so a, i'm at peace with that so yeah. you're okay with people not yeah. crediting all of a sudden on, on uh, usually just like you know a credit's great just because it's part of i do it for bands right and to you know, hopefully I can, you know, it might lead me to some other work or some other relationship down the road. Um, but yeah, having that, that's nice. Now, when it gets to a place of like, hey, I'm going to come in for my free portrait session and can you do this and do that and do that <laughs> because I need this for an album cover and then uh, <laughs> let's, let's dial back, you know. Yeah, I just, it's it's part of that. Like here, here is this, it started out as like, I'm documenting like these awesome musicians that have come through Mile. And, you know, that's how it started out. And I think that that's what it is, but, yeah. You had, uh, I'm drawing a mind blank, the uh, replacements, guy from the replacements. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, Tommy Stinson. Yeah, Tommy Stinson did a, yeah. a set at uh, he, one of the venues. Yeah, he uh, yeah he also was a bassist Guns N' Roses yeah. for a while. But, yeah, He's in Soul he Asylum for a while? <laughs> played in the basement of our of our uh, our space at Mile Music. I, I forgot what year, if that was 20, 27, 2018. 
maybe. Yeah. And we also had the we had the so we also and at the same time we had the um the sideshow. The uh I forgot the name it uh Seven Deadly Sins or whatever it was. They came in and did a sideshow event and I remember when we did that and it was in the basement, like completely beyond fire code. <laughs> <laughs> in the city of Appleton, you know, the one exit, you know, in the basement. Um, which is awesome. But I remember looking out at Milo Music and seeing like this line that like went down the parking lot all the way back around to Wells Fargo Bank. And I was like, what is happening? <laughs> but yeah, he, um, Tommy ended up playing a, playing a show in our basement. Yeah, I mean, that's a the, wild guy. That's the stuff for Milo that I like is like that spontaneous stuff and then the, the thing that afterwards people are like oh i didn't know about that i wish i would have known about that ah. because you've got your ear out yeah you know listening and our our mile space has always been uh that that year um we were we had some help from mile but other than that you know we really from then on we're completely independent space so we you know adam and i and you know scott Wattswillick and marty you know we just do this to do it to be a part of the event and we over the years we've got nothing nothing but like oh wow this was like a just a really cool experience and thank you for doing this because you just don't see that and i've had you know other people that have come to me and said hey come into my space and do this thing well we kind of really and i really appreciate that like I, I i love the community reaching out every time i put a call out to find a space but um it's it's nice we create our own culture around it which is really cool and a lot of fun, especially with Marty's storytelling is awesome. You know, that adds to it. it. Marty is just, he's a really interesting guy. How did you meet Marty? Um, years ago after his father um, passed away, he had this mohawk, right? And so a friend of mine, Steve Wagner, brought him to my studio to get some pictures because Marty wanted some pictures with his mohawk because he promised his dad, you know, I'm not gonna cut off this mohawk until you're in the grave. <laughs> So he, that's what he did. And then he came to the studio and he took some pictures. And ever since then, I, I got to know Marty and um, especially through, then it reconnected a little bit through my music and storytelling and Marty's, um, Marty's every bit of my family. You and, <laughs> He's just, you and your wife, Melanie, like designed some, some of his merchandise yeah, for him. And yeah, um, I, anything we can do to support him and what he's doing because he's an inspiration. You know, if you're ever having a bad day, just go talk to Marty Sosnowski, Meat Man. <laughs> <laughs> just go talk to Meat Man because glass half full, right? He's like, he, he, he could be having a rough day. He's like, I'm having a great day, you know? It's crazy. You know, just his passion for life and his, um, you know, what he stands for just means the world to me. Like, you know, if I'm having a bad day, I, talk to, I, know, I, can, I know I can talk to Marty because he's going to be, look. You know, you have this, this, and this going on, and yeah. He did a, a chicken foot throwing competition Dead. at the the venue where you buy Crazy Sweet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so every year when we do that, we after storytelling, there's a chicken foot throwing contest, and his storytelling is just bar none. I mean, he is a legendary storyteller, and he is just drawing so much attention. He does a sh uh, he does a show in Green Bay at Cheesecake Heaven once a month usually fall through early winter or spring. Um, but his storytelling is just unbelievable the way that he's able to like. There was a, a really special moment between you guys at, at that uh, mile of music where he presented you with a pass, I believe from tool yeah. with, that you were kind of lusting after for a while. Yeah. But that was kind of an emotional time to see that because you could see how close you guys were, the bond between yeah. you guys. But yeah, I was glad to be there for that, to see that. But oh. um, if people haven't checked out Marty's storytelling, it is something you should, you should at least see. And yeah. it's, he's animated. He's got a ton of stories. Like you said, yeah. really infectious, positive and, attitude. Yeah. And all his stories are true. That's, that's Marty's thing. The truth will come out, you know, and, and you know, the truth, the truth heals, truth heals. And um, yeah, it's, he's amazing. Let's talk about Steel Panther. You did some album covers for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I've done, I've been working with Panther for a number of years now. Um, that's because my, my good buddy, Jason Luckberg, he's, he like helped me like get into the music industry, the larger national music 
uh, industry uh, doing bands, but he was um, brought me to Steel Panther, and I did that first shoot with them. So I've done uh, ever, ever since All You Can Eat, all those records. I've done all the covers plus all the promos. I didn't do the the uh, their latest records called On the Prowl, <laughs> um, but I I didn't do that one just because of time and and you know logistics and stuff. But um, I've done their stuff, and they they that, that's another group that's very they're very loyal to me, and I know them. I know. I know Sticks uh, really well, Darren. Darren um, Leader. Good, yep. Uh, good friend. I talked to him. I talked to those guys, you know, text them, whatever. But they, um, I have, have a really good relationship with them. And I go the extra mile to make sure that their stuff always looks top tier because, you know, that's what you got to do it. That's a, a good example of a band that is being supportive back. Uh, Seal Panther did a, a series of, uh, I guess, live streaming events where they would interview a photographer that shot them at some point and yeah. then they would show pictures and you could order prints online and uh sticks the drummer did yours so yeah. he said you guys talked for i think 30 40 minutes yeah. and people could buy prints that that you shot of of steel panther yeah was that kind of a a nerve-wracking experience no not at all because <laughs> talk, talking to darren's just like, <laughs> I was like talking to my homie no not at all um yeah, that was. Uh, I think the. Sh- I think the, that series is called Sex JPEGs and Rock and Roll. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's Steel Panther. Um, but yeah, they, uh, yeah, it was really cool that they did that because they were giving back because they have so many photographers at their shows, and so many photographers that they've made relationships with at their shows that they were able to give back. Mine was a little different because I have shot them at a few shows and I've done all of their promo content for years. I like it. Uh, at some point, the question came up about how it is to shoot them. You're like, oh, they're easy. And it's like you can tell because they are obviously really good at posing for photos. And they just have that that whole thing down as far as what look. It's no work whatsoever. <laughs> just, you know, get the camera up there. It it can be because, you know, you have, you have to be able to get the shot, especially when they've been around and have been doing this for so long. You have to get the shot and get it fast because... You know, you can't sit on a photo shoot for nine hours. You know, let's get this done in two and a half. I think that's what Sticks talked about too during that was like, you got to be able to get in there and do it. But the fact that they gave back to photographers was like, you know, fantastic of them, especially during, you know, the COVID-19 lockdowns and stuff, you know. Yeah. Did you find yourself getting a lot done during covid lockdown or did you find it sort of just sitting around waiting sitting around waiting i had i didn't have creative bone in me and that's why after like the first month of being at home i went back to work (laughs) (laughs) i went back to the studio you know i had to because that's kind of a space where i can you know at the time it was only adam and i and adam and i weren't going anywhere you know my employee heather she was working from home working remotely um but we were we were there, so we got work as much work done as we could. And I had one client that made specific work for me during that time, which was awesome. That's awesome. But creatively, like doing anything personal, or like I'm gonna use this time to be super creative, and you know, like some musicians, I'm gonna write a record or whatever. Not I, not a creative bone. And I talked to other people that like said that's okay. It's okay to not feel that way. It's okay to feel like you're in a lull. I was just talking last night about, you know, someone asked me about personal work. I said, I'm not doing any personal work right now because I'm so busy with client stuff and then I'm going home at the end of the day, tired and, you know, pick up my kids or, you know, get dinner ready and sure, you know. So it's okay, I think, to to experience that ebb and flow creatively in your life. To uh, close the book on the Steel Panther portion of the conversation, you did two record covers for them. You did All You Can Eat, which was a lot of compositing work as you, you talked about when you were talking with sticks yeah and then lowering the lowering the bar i yeah. believe adam made a <laughs> he made he made a debut i also i actually actually did heavy metal rules too i didn't know that yeah which we ended up shooting in appleton and then re reshot it in um orange county but yeah so we did the three um the last one was yeah the the one so lower the bar was shot at deja vu in appleton so we, I shot the cover there with local models, and Adam was on the cover, which is great. And then um, Panther came to, they're playing a show on Green Bay, so they came, we did that photo shoot 
before their show and they we did it here that's pretty cool yeah. it's kind of getting appleton kind of mixed in with the, yeah. the national yeah scene great. do you have a album cover from panther out of the three that you think turned out the best um lower the bar is probably my my favorite but all you can eat was the the funny thing about all you can eat is we had the album title so so jason and the band came to me with the album title and we didn't know we didn't really know what we were just throwing a bunch of ideas out and finally i came up with the idea of the last supper and they were like that's genius and i was like though i was able to make that mark by creating that you know we shot that whole thing in la it's like 15 different pictures all the food that's on the table on that album cover was shot here in appleton the backgrounds 3d rendered you know that whole thing was one giant composite and it was cool that i that they took that idea and ran with it and i heard you know a bunch of different places like this has got to make this has got to be album cover of the year <laughs> you know which is really cool to see that happen um you know as i progress with my work i see that my work gets better so you know technically it's a great cover but then you can see how it like improves as you go down the road so i've had my hand in some of that creative process which is really really cool to be able to like help brainstorm that and come up with those ideas and put those pieces together and problem solve it's got to be a trip to go into a record store in a different state and see an album cover you it's worked wild. on there really really wild yeah it's cool to cool to see that like in print like i always love seeing my you know holding up that lp and seeing my work in print is amazing you know. So then you send them a box. You're like, hey, guys, can you sign these 20 vinyls? <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I've had them sign. Like the first couple of records, I had them like, sign just because I want to keep that for myself. I have that guitar. I have the, you know, Russ's satchels. The leopard print. Leopard print guitar signed by them hanging in my office, you know. You're a guitar collector, aren't you? Because I, I know I've, I've seen... <laughs> I've seen in the background, you've got like a Zach Wilde guitar. Yeah, and so that's his signature. That's a signature signed by Zach Wilde. Um, one of my favorite living, other than, you know, Eddie Van Halen, Zach Wilde has always been just one of my favorite guitarists. And it's cool to have that. And I have the guitar signed by the Black Dolly Murder guys before Trevor Trevor passed. Um, but yeah. Have you thought about taking lessons? Mm -hmm. You know a lot of people. I, I mean, I, I don't have the time. <laughs> I got to I got to go and shoot some personal projects before I can take guitar <laughs> lessons. But and then I have the you know the record collecting hobby too. Yeah, how many records of, do you have? Seventeen hundred wow. plus. Yeah. How many do you listen to? Uh, as much as I can. <laughs> yeah. So do you have a, a music room set up? I do. I have like an office with all that stuff. All my things are uh, in our house. But I, you know, I wish I had more time for it. And, you know, Melanie's been on my case. Oh, well, you could sell some of those. Then we could go on vacation somewhere. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I think vinyl, there's worse things than uh, a vinyl addiction, yeah. I think. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I think so. You had a really cool experience out at Pachyderm Studios, which yes. is a legendary recording studio out in Cannon Falls, uh, Minnesota. Yeah. Live throwing copper was yeah. recorded there, Nirvana in utero. In utero. Babes in Toyland, Soul Sound, just a lot of different things. Yeah. How did and you were out there, yeah, with your band. But what what pulled you out to to Pachyderm? Um, Norma Jean, um, I friended Corey years ago, a few years ago, a few years back, and uh, Corey's lead singer of Norma Jean, and um, we went out there to do a, a a promo shoot, and I took Adam with me, and we're like, you know what? While we're out there, while they're recording, they're re out there recording Polar Similar. Cause Corey called me on the phone one day and he's like, Hey dude, we're going to be in your neck of the woods. Can you, cause I had previously reached out to the band to Norma Jean and said, Hey, I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan since bless the martyr. Um, I reached out to them at one point said I through their label. I'd love to, you're coming to play the rave. Can I take some pictures? And I went and shot them for like 10 minutes, took pictures. They loved them. So then out of the blue, Corey calls my phone I'm like, Oh crap. And he, um, so he reached out and said, hey, we're going to be in your neck of the woods. You want to come shoot some promo photos we need it for our new album, Polar Similar? You know, he sent me all the demos, some of the stuff that was going on. So we went out, so we went out there and, the, you know, and got to Pachyderm, which is, it's out of space and time. It's so cool being on, on, until you're out there in the dead of winter and how awesome it is and spooky at the same time. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. So we went out there, um, 
just to shoot those promo photos, but that turned into four days. And we just so happened to bring two video cameras and we shot a 45 minute documentary called Luminaries for Polar Similar. Like the making of. <laughs> Poof, documentary that wasn't planned. Crazy, plus we got other <laughs> footage from, and it turned out beautifully. Well, you got a lot of a good like interview clips and lots of good stuff that was slowed down because that house is just never ending like backdrop for, yeah. for that kind of stuff yeah. in the studio too. And I, I rewatched that whole thing recently in preparation for this. And you, you caught a lot of funny scenes, like when Corey's trying to get his printer to work. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's so true. And then it looks like it's great because the edit, you know, edit Adam did on that was fantastic. Cause he was like, he was trying to get this, this printer to work for, I don't know how long. And then he ended up having to handwrite the, handwrite the lyrics to, to tape up on the wall. And it just that cut from like, he's like, I don't think this printer's going to work. And then he cuts <laughs> to him like in the vocal booth with like handwritten lyrics on the wall. And then he talks about his lyrics. So it's like certain parts of the edit there just really worked out great. But cool thing there too was the, I mean, how they recorded it and the places they recorded it, like recording in the pool was like the sounds they got out of that. And Josh Barber, good friend of mine, producer who produced polar similar like was doing some cool stuff like you put a mic in a in a kool-aid pitcher in that reverb in that room and when jeff hickey was playing get that guitar part the opening to the i think it's the opening to the song the nexus like it just created a vibe and i think that that's what they wanted with that record was a vibe was it hard in that situation to kind of step back and kind of blend in with the the background kind of is it's I cut and, I think Adam cut me out like a million times. <laughs> no, but it, it was no. So you didn't it, think you were gonna be there for? I mean that it just turned into that we were sleeping like four hours a night. You know we were we were we were there in the middle of winter and we had a twenty minute drive, thirty minute drive each way. So we were there really late at night, really early in the morning to go out there and film this. You didn't stay the night there? No, that is a lot of driving. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's nice to just it it was a lot of driving, but it's nice to just decompress after you've been in that, you know, because some of those guys would go all night long, and Corey would sleep, and he'd sleep all day, and then do all the stuff at night, and so. So when when you were there, did you do a little exploring in the house? A little bit, yeah, <laughs> not too much, but it just a weird, just a weird spooky vibe there. It's really cool because you know, like in Luminaries, where we cut the picture of Nirvana sitting on that fireplace. Uh, that's an iconic picture yep you know and you know comfort by failure was recorded out there which is really cool um but you there's a history there now that place was um was was a, a basically abandoned and trashed and i believe in 2014 or 15 they came in and completely redid it and that's when I forgot the guy that took it over, but it was a it's a cool recording studio because they have a you know vintage Neve in there. They have I mean the sound in that room, like Polar Similar. That record is that you can hear you really truly can hear the sound of that room, that you know that live room. It's gotta, crazy. Got to be kind of a trip as well, listening to that album and actually remembering being there yeah, for certain because takes. We had things that we asked the band to do actually ended up on the record like um philly philip ferris F philly we'd had him play we had him play like slide guitar for this one for just just to riff and play slide guitar and that actually made it on the record so, and which is really cool so we, we had some of those influences in in like our our we we just wanted that as b-roll but it ended up on the record and you know um bob turkovic and um, Josh Barber ended up recording that, which is really, really cool. Um, but having those, because I think in that creative process, if you can have an impact on something, I think there's more people than just the one idea, which is really cool to see that, see that come out on a record. So, Yeah, do you think that you'd do anything like that in the future if the right situation arises where you're actually going into it knowing you're going to do a documentary? Or was there less pressure? There was, there was no was pressure just kinda... because we just did it. We just did it, right? Um we're working on one right now that's in the works, not band related, but with regards to Marty and his storytelling. It's it's just an arduous process because we thought we would do something and get it done in a short amount of time, but it's turned into now it's turned into this monster. This like there's so many more things that's unfolding in the story that we started a year and a half ago with him, 
And is once it it's like finally a biography, kind of. It's just yeah, it's just about you know his story and storytelling and his um, yeah. I'm not going to go too far into it, but it's it's kind of writing itself right now as we go, like especially lately. So you know, I think that's a cool thing about stories. The stories continue to write themselves over time, which is really cool. And I think that's what this is. But hopefully, we're going to get that out here in the next year. I think that would be pretty <laughs> it's, cool. It's cool. It's pretty involved, but yeah. Well, we kind of now we're we're obviously over, but I've got a few more questions for you. Yeah, you you shot uh, some stuff at Rock USA. Mm -hmm. Do you like being in the right in front of the stage there? Or do you prefer to be on the side? Um, side. Is is that just better for it's, getting angles, or is it just not? Well, as I'm 48, and my ears are going oh. south, <laughs> <laughs> and I always forget earplugs. Um, yeah, it's tough being up in the pit. So, so when I did Rock USA and Country USA, we were there with the production team with Hypervibe at the time. Um, well, they're still Hypervibe, and we um, so so we would doc we were able to document everything behind the scenes, side stage. So we had full reign of, of the the place. And usually after the third song, you get the boot. Third song in those big shows, you get the boot. They want you out before they're all sweaty and like. Yeah. So so we would usually be able to shoot beyond that especially i know the band i can shoot however long i want except for luke bryan which i, I a great story probably don't have enough time but his uh his security detained me after like 30 <laughs> seconds into the uh, fourth song when i was shooting way back like physically grabbed me and detained me and made me take delete pictures off my camera that's like you're which at the, at the time i was like you know what i'm i'm cool but now thinking back like like you're going hands-on to a photographer come on dude you know it's crazy <laughs> that's a whole long story there but you know i push the limits right and sometimes you have to push the limits to kind of get awesome stuff but it was just a weird it was a yeah. weird moment that, <laughs> no weird story well at the time you're probably you probably knew you pushed the limits at the time but oh, then yeah. after you have a chance to think about it it's like yeah that wasn't cool <laughs> why, why, are you, why are you putting your hands on me there's like three it was like three guys and one guy had like his arm around my neck does it when you're in a situation where you're in the press pit in the front i mean it, i'm guessing it's everybody's trying to angle to get the best shot and it's kind of yeah. people trying to push your box out an area yeah. to keep people out it it can be a fight up there especially the bigger headlining bands but when i shot alabama well i, I the did this, the country band yeah. alabama <laughs> yeah so i did <laughs> So I had this little trick. My little trick was I had this monopod where I'd screw my camera onto with a big fisheye lens, and I had this remote trigger. So I'd like put this thing on a stick, my camera on a stick, with this really wide angle fisheye, and I'd like lift it up and remote trigger the the camera, and it took the shot so I could get an angle that nobody else could. And I was doing that, and it would it would, it would peeve some of these other. I think some of the other photographers were like wow, man. but I did that one time. <laughs> From the side of the stage when Alabama's playing, and I, I don't, I don't know the lead singer, but he was like in front of the crowd on this like walkout portion that goes, it sticks out, you know, ten and the catwalk feet, type thing, the catwalk, right? And I had this up there, and I'm like, shh, shh, and I like, as I'm shooting this, he turns around and he sees this stick above the stage <laughs> because my head, <laughs> my head's just like barely, my head's just like barely above, it's just barely above the stage, so, um. He sees this, and he proceeds to just stare at me, and just look me down. And um, I, I, I was like, because all attention, all of his attention was on me, and so was the crowd because he was looking at me. And I just like, I'm like, I'm out of here, Pew, gone. <laughs> but yeah, you got you got to be clever how you find new ways to do things. But you know, don't be too intrusive. But you know push the limits once in a while i guess we had a, another question which i failed to ask before because i forgot that it came in but uh not find it but what, right. do you have do you have any advice for up-and-coming photographers yes um learn the craft really well so when it's you know learn put in all the time so down the road you don't have to think about cameras or camera settings be because it's more about the story you're trying to tell do all that stuff right away. Nerd out on all the gear right away. Don't get hung up in gear because so many pho photographers are gear, gear, gear. What's worked for me is story, human relationships, vision. And that's and just knowing what you want to create. 
Do you meet a lot of people that think that they can just buy a camera and jump right into it? Yes. And <laughs> do you normally just want to, you know, tell them, hey, don't do it that way, be smart about yeah, it? Yeah, you want to, but yeah. If someone comes to me for like absolute critique and advice, I for sure would, you know, I would for sure, you know, tell them that they need to, they need to, you know, give them the hard words. Good critique means the world, you know. If you want critique from me, I'm going to be honest with you. But if, you know, you know, if you just think you got it made, well, you're going to have to struggle through some things. Because my mentor, Zach Arias, gave me the hard words, just like I did a portfolio with, review with Jody Peckman, who was a senior photo editor of Rolling Stone magazine. This was back at the Palm Springs Photo Expo in New York City. When I laid my portfolio down in front of her and she just boop, 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 boop flick, flipped through it. And this Rolling Stone, senior photo editor, closed my book, goes, You'll, I'll never hire you <laughs> because your work is too this. It's too clean, too polished. Hmm. But then she goes, you know something? Your work here, your technical, your compositing, there's other avenues for you to explore and become successful at. And if I didn't hear those words or those words from my buddy Zach, those tough words, you know, I brought... 230 photos to him and he like went through all my photos and he picked like one that was like you you should start here after all these pictures you know hearing those hard words it sucks but if you don't then or if you don't want to hear it then i don't know what i can tell you so that's the long answer long form is there anything of the uh jumping all over the place is there anything of the appleton scene that you would change or that you would like to see changed as far as music goes that's a tough one. More inclusive to metal because I think the, and, and hip hop for sure. Um, the metal thing, I think for the longest people thought, you know, metal is just devil worship music. It's not, you know, I want to, I would like to see more inclusive inclusivity with that. Um, but I think we do a good job here. Um, I also, I also do believe that, you know, I'd like to see some diversity with Milo music too. In that regards, I think that's been, you know, people have talked about that. You know, that's just my thoughts. That's my <laughs> thoughts there. I think that we could we could diversify a little bit on some of that stuff, which I think they're doing better at. I, I really, I really think Miles is getting better at that. I truly want to believe that, you know. Well, Dave, I want to thank you for everything that you've done for the music scene. You've definitely made your mark, and I know there's lots coming up in the future. What is the future of Jackson and Company? Where do you see the company going from here? Um, I just keep on trucking, you know, doing what we're doing. I want to. We're always in a place. My wife and I are always in a place of like we want to grow it. More clients, new clients. You know, some of those client relationships don't last forever. And I think as long as we can grow and learn and not, you know, don't get stubborn or stale, like create more impressive work, continue learning. I think that's kind of setting us up for success, you know, and, and we have a long way to go. I don't have it all figured out. You know, I don't have it all figured out, but we're, as long as we keep our family, we we're keeping it small, you know, with Adam and Heather, I love them and Jamie and my wife, keep it small, keep it family and value each other. That's important. And I'm going to keep fighting for, you know, them and my craft. So, it's great to see great to see them just grow in creativity it's fantastic to see so dave thanks again i sincerely yeah. appreciate you doing glad, this glad to be here man it was fun where can people find out more about jackson uh, the company david e jackson david e like edward jackson dot com or at david e jackson on instagram my instagram's part personal part work i have terrible time like hey it's just a work <laughs> side but yeah um my work's out there um yeah or Facebook. <laughs>